I've entitled the sermon, Trinity the Sermon. We're going to start in the New Testament. We'll bounce around to the Old Testament and uh, back and forth. Isaiah 55, 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. You know, there are mysteries that naturally come with faith in God. Because if we could figure out our God exactly, he wouldn't be much of a God, would he? Farrell Robertson was a Sunday school teacher in the, in the church that I grew up in. He taught the junior high class, and he was giving a lesson on the Trinity one time. And, and at the end of it, he said, uh, can anyone tell me what the Trinity is? And like junior high school students all around the world, we just kind of uh, <clears throat> looked at our shoes a little bit. And so he said, Steve, can you tell me what the Trinity is? Steve Reed, a good friend of mine. And Steve said, and Mr. Robertson said, I, I didn't quite understand that. Can you tell me what the Trinity is? And in a little bit elevated voice, he said, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And Mr. Robertson wanted everyone in the class to, um, to hear. And so he said, Steve, I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. And Steve Reed, the wisest junior high boy I ever met, he said, it's a mystery. You're not supposed to understand it. <laughs> you know, you preach the sermon called Trinity, and the word Trinity is not in the Bible anywhere. And I would love to start a sermon on any subject and share a scripture that proves my point, and then the rest of the sermon, I could build upon that foundation. But I can't do that today, because the word Trinity is not in the Bible. So I'm going to have to depend on two things today. I'm going to have to depend on you. I will provide some scriptures, but I would like you to keep an open mind about the concept that we have a hard time understanding because we have a hard time explaining it sometimes. And I'm going to depend on you for that, but I'm also going to depend upon the Holy Spirit to reveal something that he wants us to know about, about this interesting subject called the Trinity. Now, we might think that we already know what we know about the Trinity, but today we're going to keep an open mind, and then we're going to let the Spirit of the Lord teach us what he wants us to know. And I believe that when we keep an open mind, when we invite the Holy Spirit, we're going to learn something new. God will reveal himself. Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. My brothers and sisters, if we're looking for God today, he's going to show up. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come into your your kingdom, your throne room. And we acknowledge that you are the great creator. We acknowledge that Jesus Christ is your son, our savior. And we acknowledge that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would reveal your truth to us today. And so, Lord, we pray that for the next 10 or 15 minutes, we could keep the world outside and that you could speak to your children. Speak, Lord, for your children are listening. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A doctrine in the Christian church is what we believe about what the Bible teaches. That's what a doctrine is. We have doctrines about church. We have doctrines about salvation. We have doctrines about sin. We have doctrines about mankind, life and death, heaven and hell. And one of the most important Christian doctrines about what we believe has stirred up discussions for centuries. It's the doctrine of the Trinity. Men and women are still asking questions about that today. And the Christian view of Trinity is that God is not one single person. God is tri-personal. There are three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they all deserve to be called God. And yet there's one God, not three. It's like Steve Reed said, it's a mystery. 
And I've often said that if you want to be a, a good theologian, I said this last week, if you want to be a good theologian, if you want to be a good student, then you have to believe what Jesus believed. Because if you believe something that Jesus did not believe, if you don't believe something Jesus did believe, it's going to take a toll on your spiritual well-being. So when we think about God the Father, we think about He is the Creator. He's the one who spoke heaven and earth into existence. His name is Jehovah, the existing one. That is the proper name of the one true God. Sometimes he is known as Theos. That word Theos means God. That's where we get theology and a theologian from. Someone who is, uh, studies God is a theologian because Theos is God. In Timothy's, uh, in the second letter to Timothy, Paul wrote, Grace mercy and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. So we look at that and we understand that God, or that the Father is God. And Jesus Christ is also called the Son of God. In human terms, we naturally think that the Son will be less than the Father, or at least under the authority of the Father. And if anyone anyone claimed the authority of God like Jesus did, it would be hard for someone to believe. If I claim to be God, it, it has no authority. And yet Jesus claimed to have unity with God that no one had claimed before. This authority can only be claimed by God himself. In the Gospel of John, for this reason they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was Jesus breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus did not deny that he was God. He said, God is my father, and they wanted to kill him because he identified himself as God. God the Father. God the Son. But the Trinity doesn't end at two. At the first Christian church in Jerusalem, the, um, the members had this habit of pooling all their money, pooling all their resources. It was a voluntary act. It was not a requirement for membership at this first church 2,000 years ago. There was a couple named Ananias and Sapphira, and their property was to manage however they wanted to manage. But they came to Peter. And they laid money at Peter's feet, and they said that we sold this property for so and so, um, so much money. But they lied to the Holy Spirit. They had really sold that property for one price, but they told him it was another price. Acts chapter 5. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? and to keep back some of the price of the land. You have not lied to men, but to God. Look at that passage. The Holy Spirit is God. And looking at these three verses, we can conclude that the Bible plainly calls the Father God, plainly calls the Son God, plainly calls the Holy Spirit God. And knowing all that, knowing that the Father's God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. It seemed like an irony that the Christian church remains faithful by insisting there is only one God. But you know, it's an echo that we hear from all the way back in the Old Testament. In the book of Isaiah, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. For I am God, singular. So how can a believer call Father, Son, and Holy Spirit God and see them as just one? It is a mystery. I know that the idea that God is one and that God is three, it sounds like a contradiction. So I had this example. Does anybody remember Charles Dickens' uh, A Tale of Two Cities? Can anybody tell me the first line in that book? What's that? What? 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 Who said that? Oh, my gosh, my gosh, yes. <laughs> he gets a candy bar for knowing his literature so much. <laughs> it's 
sorry, Trisha ate the one with almonds. <laughs> yes, yes, the first line in that book, um, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Good one, pulling that answer right out of thin air. Very good. And so we think that, well, that must be a contradiction for um, Charles Dickens. Um, but it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. And clearly we see there's a contradiction there. If Dickens means that it was the best of times in the same way it was the worst of times. But it's not a contradiction at all. He means that in one sense, it was the very best of times. And in another sense, in another way, it was the worst of times. And so the concept of the Trinity is not a contradiction for God to be both three and one, because he's not three and one in the very same way. God is one. God is three at the same time, but not in the same way. It is a mystery. But the Bible talks about mysteries. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord, our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of this law. There are some things that we are never going to understand on this side of heaven. And that's where, that's where the Christian's faith comes in. And for a person who's always trusted their mind to understand the world with logic, to them, faith is a cop-out. They say, if you don't understand something, so you just call it faith. But my brothers and sisters, in the Christian life, faith, it's a powerful, powerful tool. It is by faith that we are invited into the kingdom of heaven. And I don't think there has to be a conflict between faith and logic. After all, God is the author of both of them. I believe that faith and logic can exist together. And I'll tell you how I know that. You're getting ready to go down to Rayleigh's. You get in the car, you put your seatbelt on, you start the car, and you're finger hits the radio button. Now, you don't know exactly how it works, but somewhere there's radio waves out wherever they are, and something in your car is looking for those radio waves. You don't understand it, do you? But by faith, your finger pushes that button, and pretty soon, you're singing along with the music. Faith and logic, they have to work together. That can only be when they work together that faith is proved in the life of a Christian. And the Apostle Paul tells us when he's talking about faith and logic surviving together, in his letter to the Thessalonians, Paul wrote, but examine everything carefully and hold fast to that which is good. God does not expect us to have an illogical faith. Instead, instead our God challenges us to believe in the impossible. A realistic logic faith in Christ demands that the basic beliefs that we preach and teach about the church in the church and about the Trinity in our church, we might not fully understand it, but by faith, we believe it. And if we do not fully understand the Trinity, our God is not afraid of questions. Christianity does not have to make any apologies. And so we can be confident in the fact and our faith because it's our faith that brings us into the kingdom of God, into the arms of an eternal loving God. And so here we are. We're on the doorstep of the house that we call Trinity. One God, three personalities. Three personalities, one God. So where do we go from here? Well, we open up the Word of God and try to discover what we can. And there are many, many scriptures in the Bible that clearly show the three personalities of God. We might not understand it, but we believe it. And we're, it's proved when we open the Word of God. In the, Matthew, or in the Gospel of Matthew, and after being baptized, Jesus went up immediately from the water, 
And behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and coming upon him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is the first time in the New Testament that the Trinity is together. Each person of that Trinity is clearly represented. It seems to me that this is a miraculous event in the spiritual realm. There's the voice out of heaven saying that he's well pleased with the physical ministry of his son on earth, who, by the way, will be strengthened by the Spirit of God. And look at that phrase up there, and behold, the heavens were opened. Do you think that's Matthew giving us a weather report? (laughs) Probably not. So it means something else. It means the heavens were opened. This is the beginning. This is the beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ. It's the perfect time that God has come to the earth for one purpose, to open up the heavens for us. The gospel of the Bible is simply this. God created you. Genesis 1.1. God loves you. John 3.16. You have sin in your life. Romans 3.23. Your sins separate you from God, Isaiah 59, 2. God loves you. He created you. And you have sin in your life, and that sin separates us from God. And yet, we bounce back to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Ah, God so loved the world. He came to save sinners. And the love that God has given us has been overwhelmingly demonstrated in the cross of Christ. So let me ask you to ponder something for just a moment. Who is it in your life that you would give your life for? Would it be a family member? Probably. Why? Because you love them. Jesus died for us while we were still sinners. Jesus Christ even died for his enemies. Jesus Christ came into the world and died for those who were perishing in order to bring us into the company of God because he loved us. We sang about it this morning. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. And I think, how can anyone, how could anyone reject that kind of love? His love for us should lead to an eternal embrace. My brothers and sisters, don't try to figure it out. Just surrender to the love of God. Because one day, we will all say goodbye to this physical body that we have, but our soul will have an eternal home. It is Jesus Christ who invites us into the kingdom of heaven, and he did it through his death and his resurrection. And when we pull our faith, and believe that only God can bring us into the kingdom of heaven through his Son. When we assign the impossible to God, we are saved through our faith because that day that heavens were opened, on the day that Jesus was baptized, it is our faith and the love of God that we are saved. 2 Corinthians 6.2, today is the day of salvation. If you've called Jesus Lord before, today you have a place in the kingdom. But if you have not, today is the day of salvation. Today we are talking about the Trinity. It is the full power of God in three persons who is able to save us. They all showed up at the baptism of Jesus the Son. Matthew 12, 28. The words of Jesus, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These words of Jesus are the most convincing proof of the doctrine of the Trinity. Jesus believed in the Trinity. He gives importance to the divinity of the Father, but also of the Son, the divinity of the Holy Spirit. And if we're baptized into the name, it would show that there's a great dependence upon that name. It would prove that we are to be honor give honor, be devoted to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as one, as one. 
Three names, one phrase, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? I don't know if you know this about me or not, but before I come and preach a sermon, before I teach in a uh, Bible study, I always ask someone to pray for me. And many times the prayer starts out with, Our Father who art in heaven. And it most always ends in Jesus' name. But there are those men and women who pray for me. And they start out, Our Heavenly Father. And right in the middle, they include the Holy Spirit. And then they close in Jesus' name. Can I tell you, can I tell you what a powerful, powerful prayer that is for your pastor? We've invited God the Father, the Creator. We've invited the Holy Spirit who gives me strength. We've invited Jesus Christ, my Savior, into that prayer. When we pray, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it should roll off our tongues. But look at that verse. Do you want to see a paradox in that verse? Jesus says that we are to make disciples, baptizing them in the name, singular, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Plural. Can a Christian be baptized without all three names? No. Jesus didn't believe it, neither do I. One God, three personalities. And let me remind you that where we started this morning, we're looking at the theological um, idea of the Trinity Trinity is not found anywhere in the Bible. We're looking for verses that point to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I want to remind you, by the way, we're expecting the Holy Spirit to show us something and teach us what he wants us to know. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, Paul wrote, For through Jesus we both have access in one spirit to the Father. I don't know about you, but... This has to be one of the perfect verses explaining the doctrine of the Trinity without saying the word Trinity. And the idea is that the Christian church is entitled to the Father through the Son and in the Spirit. It's summed up in one sentence. It's perfectly detailed. It's clearly stated. It's positively settled. But notice one more thing that seems obvious to me. We don't need anyone else to get close to God. We don't need a mentor. We don't need a priest. And we don't need a pastor. Every single person on earth has access to God through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, we don't have to pass through a series of guarded doors and locked gates. Since Jesus is God, we have access to God through Jesus. Amen? Amen. All right. I was waiting for it. You weren't giving it to me, so I had to ask for it. (laughs) Paul continues in his letter to the Ephesians, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope, when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father, who is over all and through all and in all. The body, one body, the church, And I don't mean Lincoln Community Church. I mean the universal church. Internationally, believers who call Jesus Lord. This is the body of God. That's the church. Baptists, Catholics, Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans. The one body has one spirit. It's the spirit of God. It is the spirit who's called you to the hope we have in the one true God. And look at that verse. There is one Lord, Jesus Christ. There is one faith. Our salvation is in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And one baptism. One baptism of the Holy Spirit who has sealed us. He has held us over for eternity. And then at the end of that verse, there is one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And I want us to see that the Trinity has many, many features to offer every believer. 
the Trinity is not some far off mystical imp um, impersonal philosophy. The Trinity is real. God is real because God is personal and he makes himself known to us in many different ways for our benefit. And I think there are certain things the Lord wants people to know that are vital to our faith. And you can't get away from the fact, noticing the significance that is given to the concept of the Trinity. Three persons of the Trinity are mentioned as individuals, and yet, yet they all have the same goal, eternal life. And we start by praying in the Holy Spirit. That's one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit. In Paul's letter to the Romans, he said, In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how do we pray, how we should pray. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. I mentioned 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Today is the day of salvation. And if you've never called Jesus Lord, there's going to be an elder in our prayer room that wants to meet with you and talk with you and pray with you. And if you think sometimes, well, I just don't know how to pray. How do I start? Do we understand? Have you ever had feelings and been a loss at words because you're your words couldn't express those feelings that you had in your heart. That's what the Holy Spirit does for us when we pray in faith. When we don't know what to say. Our heart knows how we feel. And it is the Holy Spirit who helps us in our prayers. So by faith we trust the Holy Spirit to do for us something that we cannot do for ourselves. And then we keep ourselves in the love of God 1 John 4, 16, God is love. We talked about that love. You cannot deny the love that God has for the world. Praying in the Spirit, staying close to the love of God and expecting the mercy of Jesus Christ. 2 John 1, 3, grace, mercy, and peace, which come from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. Trinity, the sermon. Three persons, one God, one goal, our salvation. So after all that, what's the preacher saying today? I'm saying that like Steve Reed more than 50 years ago, the Trinity is a mystery. And we might not fully understand the God who is three and one and one and three. And we could only understand that if God was made in our image, but in reality... We are made in God's image. So does it take faith to trust God when there doesn't seem to be solid evidence? Yes. Yes, it takes faith. Does it take faith to believe that only God can do the impossible? It sure does. It takes faith. Does it fa take faith to believe in the Trinity? Yes. Yes, it takes faith. And the Trinity helps believers understand the mystery of of our great God. And I think that the Trinity can be a model for churches. Each member here, each member of this church has a different role. You have unique talents for the benefit of the church. We are unified in a relationship with one another. So I'm thinking, how can I best relate the idea of the Trinity to our church? We are one church. And 340 men and women. We are 340 people. <laughs> Yet, we're one church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. We praise your holy name. And Heavenly Father, as we've taken in what the Trinity is, Heavenly Father, let us use that name in our prayers. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray your blessing upon every person in this sanctuary. We pray that you would direct their steps, delight in their path today, Lord. Bless them and bless them big. For we ask it in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. God be praised.